Hello, everybody. Um, so we just had a fantastic talk, uh, talking about one uh, real life uh, knowledge graph being used in uh, practice. And so this is a this is a panel about really deploying knowledge knowledge graphs. And we have some great speakers for you today. I am actually not going to introduce them. And the way we're going to, because you have a nice pamphlet in your thing to tell you the background of each of our speakers, what I'm going to do is ask each of you uh, to present a little bit about your knowledge graph in practice of your company. And so we'll start with uh, Panos and then move down. And I think you have your. Yeah, OK. So I work for TextKernel. TextKernel is a provider of uh, semantic software for the HR and recruitment domain. So we serve uh, the people who and the companies that need to understand uh, people's profiles, resumes, CVs, and also vacancies. So practically the supply and demand side of the labor market. And we want to match this together. So in that uh, context, the critical aspect of domain knowledge that we need is knowledge about professions and skills and qualifications and how these are related to each other. So we need to know what professions are out there, how they're expressed in, uh, in, uh, in text, that's very important, in different languages, uh, if they mean the same thing or if they're actually something different and how they're related to each other. So it's a very conceptual knowledge graph. And uh, the main technology we use is property graphs for representing that. Uh, and the main applications of it is for semantic parsing. So we parse CVs and vacas and we extract entities relations and for search, for search query expansion and semantic uh, matching. Let's go to Natasha. Um, hi, I'm Natasha Veritim. I work, uh, I'm an information architect in Refinitiv which was previously known as uh, financial and risk business of Thomson Reuters. So we are actually a data company, and we have a huge amount of data in our knowledge graph uh, that fits actually many products, many services. One of these products is PermID that Nigel uh, Shadbot um, uh, referred to earlier. So this is a free product. We also have another product, which is Bolt Framework. My colleague, Jeffrey Horrell, will talk to you about it in a while, which is uh, an enriched uh, graphid, uh, more enriched than the PermID, which is a commercial product. So we have, a, as I said, a huge amount of context. So we maintain uh, what we call a metadata repository. Every publisher uh, in our company must uh, register their data sets in that metadata repository. Uh, they should put some metadata around it, so provenance, who is the best contact for, but also uh, they can express the semantic meaning of their data set, the different kind of distributions, how are we providing them, how these different syntactic formats con um, are represented in the semantic uh, meaning, and um, how so people can from this uh, metadata registry, people the consumers can actually discover the data sets and can understand how they can use them, and they can even uh, track uh, provenance and lineage. So how is it? How is this data set related to other data sets as well? So this metadata registry is built on AWS. It uses Neptune as a triple store. Uh, we support by temporality in our data. Uh, we do it with uh, named graphs. Uh, we, named graphs are actually used also to um, uh, support versioning in our ontologies. And actually, I won't call them ontologies. I will call them vocabularies because they are mostly utilizing Shackle because we use these schemas uh, to actually validate also the data as they enter our metadata registry. So we have 100% uh, data quality. Thanks. Hi, so um, my name is Katarina Kari, and um, I work, I'm an ontologist at Zalando. And the knowledge graph we have at Zalando is also really a vocabulary for fashion. Um, to drive use cases like search understanding and to build a slightly more dynamic browsing experiences for our customers. Um, we are also using Amazon Neptune. Um, we're using named graphs, actually. It was interesting to hear using versioning. We, we haven't gotten into versioning yet, um, certainly to explore that, but we use named graphs to um, 
write implied triples, um, have them in explicit form, so that applications that are built on top of the knowledge graph and the ontologies would um, serve more performantly. Fantastic. Sebastian. Uh, hello. Yeah, I have, so I have two stories, one of the history of DBpedia and one of the, the current uh, stuff we're doing. So uh, DBpedia is actually one of the oldest knowledge graph there is. So we, the first version was published in, two, in uh, 12 years ago. And uh, it was kind of like a knowledge graph before the word knowledge graph was even pushed by Google. So the main thing we did was we extracted the knowledge from Wikipedia and hosted it as a database and, and free publishing for everybody. Um, and this data was immensely useful. Uh, I think one of the most common use cases is to enrich search. Uh, for example, the relation between Beyonce and Ivy Park is also in Wikipedia, so it gets extracted by DBpedia. So you kind of like get this for, for free because you can just download it and it was so it was immensely useful and uh, kind of like community formed around it that improved the data quality and worked on this for years and uh, companies included this uh, into into their their database um, but so after we have a we have a fairly large community and it's very diverse like you can imagine that everybody has their own data to care about and everything um, and we're still Two years ago, we started this discussion like we are sitting kind of like all in the same boat and that we want to work with data and want to build these knowledge graphs. Uh, but the collaboration between the different community members are really is really difficult. So we changed our mission a bit or refined it. So before that, it was we put useful data on the web and people download it. And now we have the slogan that we provide global and unified access to knowledge graphs so that in the end, you can collaborate across organization borders. Um, so this collaboration comes in two flavors. So one is the, the data curation part. So in the end, uh, the data you have, somebody else has the same data, and you actually want to curate it together because it's more cost efficient. So that goes for libraries and uh, public uh, research projects and every, everything. And the other way of collaboration in the business side is more like the supply chain management. So you want to get data from somewhere else and integrate it into your your product. And uh, this is not this is still not working so well. So now we are changing from the content provision of the free data, we still do this, but we are building like a platform which is called the data bus, which, which can be used to connect knowledge graphs across organizations and reuse data and provide feedback mechanisms and more reliable supply chains to build economies. Fantastic. And yeah. Very good. Lots of different, uh, different perspectives, interesting common set of technologies. I think uh, one of the things we wanted to do in this panel is give you a little bit of a feel for what it takes both uh, technically, but more importantly, organizationally, to, to build these knowledge graphs. So um, maybe I'll start with uh, you, Panos. How, what is like the, the key thing you need to do to get started with uh, building these knowledge graphs from an organizational perspective? Why? <laughs> so define a use case that is quite specific, so you need to avoid I mean, it's good for, for selling into clients, but you need to avoid hype things and trendy things. You don't want to do it just because it's trendy. But, but because I think Katarina mentioned how she got buy-in from her VP or uh, from upper management. So for upper management, it makes sense only if it makes money. So you need to find a particular subcase that will get you a quick win and proof of concept that will show the, the viability and will buy you resources to continue. Uh, because, as I like to say, knowledge graph is not one single project. It's not, it's, first of all, it's not just the artifact. You build the artifact and then you build all the process around it to support it, to support its, its life cycle. If you only do build the artifact and you leave it like that, it will, it will die in a while because all the knowledge will be obsolete. So start with why you want to build the knowledge graph, be very specific, and then uh, try to find actually allies. Find uh, doesn't matter so much the technology. I mean, it, it matters after uh, the how matters before after the what. And for me, that's the, the message. Fantastic. Anybody else have a comment? I know we we heard a great talk from you on the why uh, in in uh, in Thomson Reuters or Refinitiv. Uh, 
What, what's the why uh, then? Well, the why for the metadata registry is, as I said, because we needed some somewhere to register all our data sets and the consumers be able to find them, but also to understand how can they use them. So we had a very specific case for the Bolt framework where we provide uh, the data in RDF. Again, as I said, my colleague will uh, explain more, but it's just another format that can be automatically integrated. So it depends on the product. Fantastic. Um, so can we dive into, so we've talked about a little bit about the why as the important part of why you should build these knowledge graphs in the first place. I'm just interested in what do you see as your current challenges in your your knowledge graph construction, and maybe we'll start with you, because uh, you know where, you know you have your 20 concepts or so, and you're building it out, and you've shown performance. So what what challenges do you have going forward? Mm, the challenge, I mean, currently we have now hundreds of concepts, oh. and 20 are the ones that are driving revenue at the moment. Um, uh, <laughs> There, I think there are a lot of challenges. One is um, that actually what would be the next use case to do because there are quite a lot of use cases. Like I would love to read DBpedia and do the Beyonce inference from there. Um, but then how many Beyonces do we have in our search? I'm not get, getting endorsement for that use case necessarily. So, so this kind of uh, capabilities that we could build, we do need a strong enough, big enough use case to actually start investing in it. Uh, and start investing like developer time to it. Um, so that's, it's like really organizational business driven, driven decisions when you're in a company that um, makes money for stakeholders. And so, um, but the, yeah, I would say that maybe the other colleagues have more, the, this, the there are others as well. Yeah, 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 the organizational business reasoning part. And Sebastian, from DBPD's point of view, what's what's really, challenging you as you move to this data bus view of, of yeah, DB so Media? The challenge is the cost, right? So Zalando can carry the cost, Thomson Reuters can carry the cost. You, are, you say, yeah, we make a two-year project, build a knowledge graph. Of course, the rewards are quite good, but um, if you don't have that resources, then data quality, for example, is really really a bad, uh, it has a bad curve because it follows the law of diminishing returns. So you increase the, you have to increase the manpower, but you cannot uh, the the increase in data quality or quantity doesn't increase with the same scale, right? So you invest more and more resources, and then you add only five percent of data quality, for example. Uh, so there, it really makes sense to pool across uh, across organizations, right? Because uh, especially in pre-competitive data. So, for example, a list of singers, list of TV shows, uh, list of authors, list of publications. So this is all publicly available information, and you should outsource the maintenance of it, like work together with other people. Because unless you have, of course, if you're a very big company like Google, you can do it in-house and, and curate it, right? But you need to, we need to break down the, the cost and make this, this commodity data cheap. And that's why we need something like a synchronization mechanism across the organizations. So are each of your uh, knowledge graphs kind of riffing off that? Consuming uh, public data, you, you said you want to consume public data eventually, maybe in the future. But is in, in text kernel, are you consuming public data the sources to help build your knowledge graphs? We do consume them, but not in a live version. So when... Every time we want to make an enrichment, we look for any type of resources that may contain the knowledge. This can be the BPDA, it can be the ESCO that I mentioned in my previous talk, it can be other web resources. Um, but usually, one problem is the um, heterogeneity of semantics. So what we mean as a skill, for example, can be in, in, in the BPDA in different things. So for example, it can be, we can take the legal domains. That's one thing we want, or the types of medical uh, areas, things like that. So we need to do mappings. And this doesn't make sense to be live. It, it's, it's a one-off project every time. Yeah. That's uh, how it works. And so far, we don't have any incentive to keep live links to the other. Or maybe no. We have only it for ESCO, because ESCO is going to be used by 
uh, the employment agencies of uh, each country. So there we do have incentive because we're going to be interoperable with them. Okay, interesting. Okay. Do you have any comment on that? Or? Oh, sorry, I'm just <laughs> No. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, let's see, I had one or two more questions. I had some very interesting questions. All of you use uh, GitHub to manage your, your ontologies and vocabularies? Or, no. or Git? Yeah, for Git. Yeah. So you use GitHub to help manage your ontologies, and DBpedia as well, the DBpedia ontology. Yeah, it's a good, good practice. Okay, interesting, very interesting. We did that as well at, at Elsevier. Um, I wanted to open it up for questions, so I'll have one more question, and if you, you, you have questions in mind, just to raise your hand, and we'll, we'll run around the, the audience to start uh, getting some questions. Uh, but before we, uh, before we get there, this is technical. Let's talk about rules and inference. So uh, <laughs> uh, a, a big uh, and interesting thing is where do you see the role of inference? Are you using rules inside your knowledge graphs, or is it just purely an entity kind of relation kind of style knowledge graph? Start with you. OK, I have been working in the industry for many years. I'm not working as a researcher or in university, so the open world assumption was a, a barrier for us. Uh, so the latest years, Shackle has come to my rescue, and we're using Shackle for uh, describing our ontologies, uh, but also we are using it as a, a rules engine uh, to create information in a controlled way. So for example, if I want to discover, if I want to create new information, if I was using inferences, it would be uncontrollable. All the information that you can get based on our axioms. And this is not something that can work in the industry. You want to create and be totally in control of the new information you will have in your triple store. So we actually have uh, worked with rules, but also in my previous uh, job, in in top quadrant as a semantic solutions architect. We were using spin rules. Uh, now we're using shackle rules in, uh, in Refinitiv. So in general, we don't use inference anymore. Okay, interesting. Inference rules like the ones that come from RDF and, or OWL um, actually not supported by Amazon Neptune. Right. Which is also very interesting. Um, Maybe it's there for a reason. Um, I remember that um, back when it was Blazecraft, the Blazecraft developers weren't really into RDFS domain and range at all. Um, and also talking, like, not seeing the benefits there. Um, we are also not implementing them. We're not making, making use of them. I was uh, considering them in the beginning, and open world assumption was really hard for my colleagues to understand and to work with. Um, so now this like example of us reducing latency has been a very practical set of rules that are application specific that we maintain and um, so we're not using the kind of rules language to define those although we could right. um, but we are just using other other scripts really other scripts. To, to do it. Fantastic, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Any panels? Uh, so about the open world assumption, also in our case it doesn't work. We don't want to have this kind of uh, inferences. It's not this kind of case. We mostly like want constraints. As, of, as uh, with respect to the standard inferences that all or RDF gives, um, again, we don't implement it in the sense that every application has its own peculiarities. Uh, to give you an example, when we make a search, when we want to expand a search query, one could say that if you are looking for a term, uh, for a concept, then all its more specific concepts should be expand, should expand, or all its synonyms could expand. That's not always the case. Why? Because, for example, some of the synonyms are just too ambiguous or too, uh, that uh, really causes a problem instead of helping us, or uh, you really don't want to, when you are looking, for example, for someone who knows um, I don't know, scikit learn as a toolkit, you don't want, some, it's very specific, so you don't want to generalize with someone who knows machine learning or something else like that. So we, any type of inference, it's incorporated into the um, applications, into the end products. Interesting, thanks a lot. Hey, and so that brings up our first question over there. So follow up with that. 
It, it strikes me that your uh, knowledge graphs are relatively mature. You're over the kind of the the hump of critical mass adoption. If I was to put you into an organization where they had no knowledge graphs, uh, what steps would you take and what tools would you be using? Um, with only one experience of, of that once at Zalando um, and having learned a lot on the way, um, the first thing probably is to, to really make it really specific of what the company needs most in that current time, just to make sure. I mean, we're talking about use cases all the time, and I guess uh, we're talking about why. We start with why. But really, for that specific company, first be very clear on the why. Mm. And then technically, um, whatever is needed. So, so sometimes property graphs might do the trick more than an RDF graph or or not even RDF, but something else. So, so, um, so the next make make that choice, but it really starts with the why. Yeah, in, in general, you should um, see the knowledge graph not as I mean, okay, there are cases where it is, but normally you can use the knowledge graph not as a replacement of your current infrastructure, but as a valuable addition. So. Uh, it helps to keep like the knowledge in ontologies and in, in mappings maybe, and but keep the normal infrastructure itself. You can even compile ontologies to Java, for example, so you have a real performance gain there. But it's good to manage this, this semantic layer separately. And then how you uh, achieve this is that you pick certain use cases which are very interesting and you build this parallel infrastructure in a prototype and show the value and that gets kind of like the attention. So, so in the end, this because DBpedia was kind of like the semantic access to Wikipedia, and it showed this that the semantification really brought uh, benefits, right? And that's also one of the reasons why Wikidata is, is there now because it, it was a good sh it was a ten years long. It was a good showcase, and then they finally came around to making Wikidata, right? So that's making the prototype showing the value th in parallel to the existing infrastructure is a low-cost investment, actually. So the answer to the question is you need to be a detective. You need to be an investigator. I mean, just go around and talk to people. You will realize that many teams will be already using some type of ontology, just they don't call it like that. It can be a simple file with some keywords. It can be an XML that's contains a relation that is not named, but it's a relation there. And you also realize that when you talk to another team, they have already al also using the same knowledge, but not the other teams. So they use their own version. Uh, so it's an investigative process that unfortunately doesn't end. You, I'm, still, I'm two years already in the company and I still get surprises about hidden knowledge, about how knowledge is used, different terminology, what what People used to call a synonym that is not a synonym. It's a, it's a hard work, <laughs> but you need to do it. So to summarize, uh, know your why, find a showcase, and uh, be a Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Right? OK. So do we have other questions from the audience? If I may add um, yeah, to sure, this absolutely. question, I have seen, I have witnessed trends in the different industries. So I have seen oil and gas uh, industry companies using Semantic Web just because they want to be compliant with ISO 5926, which is a very important standard in this industry. So this is where you should start if you are in that domain. Pharma and life sciences have, uh, for a lot of years now, have fully developed ontologies like SNOMED or MESH. So they usually, pharma and life sciences companies, what they do is they taking this uh, huge ontologies, they slice and dice it because it's, it's RDF and it's very easy to do it. They gather in their knowledge graph their own information around it and then they are using these uh, parts of the ontologies uh, for machine learning techniques. Uh, so there are other industries like consumer goods where they are using their knowledge graphs because they want to capture uh, compliance. So, for example, I have a product, but uh, this product is consist, uh, consists from many materials and molecules. 
I cannot ship it to one country because one molecule is permitted to one country but not permitted to the other. All this flexibility that RDF offers can help you um, describe all these things. And also in banks, I have been in projects where they are using uh, graphs for lineage so, and regulation compliance as well. For example, I have a, a value in my report where I will transmit to for, uh, F14, for example, in US. So where did this value in this report came from? Do I need to hire 1,000 consultants to find out where this value came from? No, if I have a lineage, an RDF lineage, and I know where this value uh, was affected upstream, or if I change this value in an asset, what is the effects downstream? So there are some uh, prominent uh, use cases now. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, other questions? Hi. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in using, uh, building a knowledge graph for the use case of um, master data management. And one of the, a few of the important things there is um, being able to keep track of data of provenance, uh, metadata, uh, by temporality, that kind of thing. Um, and neither the RDF standard or, nor any vendors out there that I'm aware of um, sort of handle this sort of stuff natively. And I was um, uh, wondering if there are any insights into how to manage that sort of stuff. So managing uh, lineage of, of your concepts, managing uh, metadata. So for provenance, there is a very nice standard. It's the provontology. We use it in Refinitiv, but I have used it in many products. For lineage and reference data, you are pretty much right. You need a data governance tool. And actually, uh, these technologies are uh, very well candidated for a data management tool where you will need to have notification. Every time something changes, people and teams need to be notified. You need to track history. So it's better uh, to manage the reference data sets or uh, master entities with a nice data governance tool. Other mm -hmm. questions from the audience? Well, we if I can yeah, just add, add to that, that um, I wouldn't actually know because we build mainly most of the governance tools and data studio tools ourselves. But that's again, like you said, that um, our company can invest in that kind of work. Um, we do very applied work, um, but I think more and more we see this on the hallway and with the sponsors of connected data as well. There are more and more good tools uh, that would make it easy. I'm, we're, and nobody's offering protege for you to work do this yeah. anymore. No, no, they're not. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, the way we publish, so we we changed, we improved a bit the way of publishing uh, now with DBpedia. Uh, the it's very technical. The data bus, uh, the data bus has a Maven plugin, uh, in the sense that you can treat. Uh, there is a similarity between data versioning and software versioning. Yeah, but there are not there are differences, but there are similarities, and then you need to change something. Anyhow, we developed the data bus Maven plugin that allows you to publish data in the same way that Maven publishes software artifacts. And we also have a triple store that collects this metadata and acts as something like the Maven Central, where you retrieve the software artifacts. So this is soft software you could use for free. I, uh, it's it is made for software releases, so it's not maybe on a daily basis like a Git model for data. There are other tools for this. You, you can search for them. Quitdiff is one, sto one store that does it. Uh, so these are track really the individual commits, while uh, the data bus Maven plugin more manages the release, releases of the versions. Yeah, so th that's a bit of a difference because you need to handle the volume, right? So you cannot publish a snapshot each, each second, right? So that, that's all I want. Fantastic. So I think we have time for one more question. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm familiar with a domain-driven design where developers uh, they, they have communications with domain experts and many other people in the, inside the business. Um, they discover uh, domain objects, value objects, all sorts of processes within a particular context, and they map that all out inside of code eventually. They, they develop some ubiquitous language, and most of this sounds very similar to 
um, ontologies and what knowledge graphs are trying to try, trying to accomplish um, not not necessarily knowledge graphs but more ontologies um, what happens to applications when uh, when they they essentially like have to or when they implement uh, ontologies um, I don't even know if this is a right question to ask, but I, I just, yeah. That doesn't make any sense at all. So uh, are you asking about how do applications interact with yeah, knowledge graphs? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And then like, it, um, where, where normally, um, or at least where, where I'm used to, where these applications, where well, these processes are, are encoded in, in just code uh, instead of, instead of. Um, a declarative form. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So maybe we'll simplify the question with, uh, how, do, how do your applications interact with the knowledge graphs that you pr provide. Maybe uh, we'll start and go around, and that'll be the last, uh, last question. Yeah, so there are many ways this can be done, and it can be in a more or less disruptive way. So we, for example, what we did in TextKernel is that we just make a custom exports. So we do have our centralized knowledge graph, and then per application, we give exports of the knowledge in a format that they were already used to. In our case, it was, uh, it was XML. Um, so it can be done in a notice draft. You don't have to tell them, no, you know, you're going to make Sparkle queries directly or Cypher queries or whatever. That's one thing. The other thing that is important for me is that uh, you have to convince your developers, if you like, or the product owners, or et cetera, in some cases to change their algorithms in order to take advantage of what the knowledge graph can provide. I mean the content. For example, if uh, you are doing entity extraction and you are not doing disambiguation, the knowledge graph can help you, but it's not enough. You need also an algorithm, and this algorithm has to be developed by the developers. So you may have the best knowledge graph, but if your applications don't take advantage of its power, you have nothing. So it's not only I'm making a, f a fancy knowledge graph and it's enough. That's Anything else to add? given that we're running out of time rapidly to, to found us this point? Maybe just both those we are doing, yes. And um, I was talking earlier about a microservice infrastructure and, and also um, there were other talks on, on having microservices on top of the graph. So um, APIs um, are, are easy to understand. It's, it's not XML, it's JSON and APIs using those. And, and putting APS on top of your knowledge graph makes a lot of sense. And then you can work under the hood on how and how the data is served. And maybe this API is implementing an algorithm that always gets smarter with the knowledge graph. All right. Let's thank, uh, thank our uh, panelists. <laughs> I think... Um,